let me get that started here. Okay, I think we're rolling now. All right, so let me go through the unit. If you have questions as we go, put them into the chat. And then if you have more like in-depth questions, we'll get those at the end that you can speak up and answer, or you can put them, go ahead and put them in the chat if you want to as well. So what I was saying about unit one, unit one is going to be um, the foundation chapter, so, or unit. Bottom line is they're never going to ask an FRQ solely on unit one. They never have, unless something changes, never will. But they will embed basic information that comes in unit one in just about every FRQ whether it's knowing how to read a map correctly, whether it's changing scale on one prompt within a seven prompt FRQ, whether it's analyzing data, all of that technically falls into unit one. So what I would like to do as a reminder to everybody is kind of give you a run through of what I would be most prepared for in unit one. So I think when the inside of an FRQ, you have a high likelihood of seeing these things pop up, okay? Now, let's start with some skill stuff. Reading maps, graphs, and charts are obviously going to be important. So whether it's dot maps or choropleth maps or cartograms, if you don't remember what a cartogram is, it's gonna, it's, I think it's important you go back and look. Remember, that's the one that changes sizes based on what you're measuring. So if we're measuring how many calories countries around the world eat, the United States is going to have, you know, a very, it's going to grow in size because it intakes a lot more calories than other places, right? Um, whereas a, one of the poorer countries in the world, maybe a Haiti, is going to shrink in size on the map from its actual size. So reviewing how we use maps, how you will utilize maps. It's not going to be about naming maps. That's not what this is going to be about. It's about when you see one, knowing how to read it, knowing what a flow chart means, knowing how to read a choropleth map or a cartogram. That's the mapping part. And then the, the different data sets on a graph and chart, knowing how to understand growth rates and declines in a slope and what that means, whether it's population, whether it's agricultural production, whatever it may be, okay? So that's some skill level stuff because they tell us in, I'll just read, I'll real quickly, I'll, I'll give them to you. Here's the skills they tell us in unit one that are extremely important. You need to understand the, understand how to read a map, be able to describe the processes, the geographical processes that take place on a map, the spatial analysis, you might remember those words, I hope. Spatial analysis, spatial association. Now, a spatial analysis means I can look at a map and I can break down what I see across the earth or that region's space. A spatial association is when I'm looking at maybe where are the farms at and where are the people living at? I'm associating how one item is related to another item, okay? So those are some skills related to the first unit that are gonna be very important, but they're mostly skills where you're going to be using them to answer other questions, if that makes sense, all right? Now, let me continue here on that, on that note as well. I anticipate that somewhere in these two FRQs, because it happens almost every year, they're going to ask you something about scale. They're going to ask you something about, you know, if you got two maps, what's the different scales that are represented on the two maps? Or if you took this map of the world or the United States and you recreated it at a finer scale, that would mean a larger scale mathematically, but it would mean a smaller area. Okay, so if you looked at it at a larger scale, then how could you give an example of a centripetal force, okay, or something like that? So you automatically have to know, if you're given a map of the state of Florida, then you would say that is a county scale map of the state of Florida. If you're giving a map of, you know, maybe the world, then you're going to say this is a world map 
shown at national scales because you're seeing country by country where they may be ranked on something. So you've got to be able to have that knowledge and own that knowledge of scale differentiation. Okay. So real important for scale, real important for spatial association and analysis and perspective. Spatial perspective just means the why of where. Here is where something is, now why is it there? And again, you're not gonna be asked the where questions this year, they've told us that. It's the why questions. Why is that religion? Why is that language? Why is that dialect? Why is that ethnicity? Why is that boundary where it is? Okay. And because it's there, then as we'll talk about later, what impact does it have socially, politically, environmentally, demographically? On and on. Okay. Let me give you the other topics that I think you will see, high likelihood anyway, not guaranteed, from unit one. Besides scale and besides um, knowing how to use maps and stimulus, you're also going to need globalization. We talked about globalization for a good part of the early year. It is huge to understand what is pushing globalization, particularly economics. It's also important to understand those who are trying to, who, those who oppose some aspects of globalization and the pros and cons of globalization. And it would be great to review from an economic perspective versus a political perspective versus a cultural perspective, because if you do that right, then you're going to start getting into lingua francas. You have to do with globalization, right? You're going to get into minority languages. You're going to get into languages going extinct. You're going to get into ethnic religions. You're going to get into syncretic religions. If you do it right, globalization and its movement to bring the world closer together through technology, and we can think time-space convergence, has created the clash of pop culture and folk culture kind of an urban and a rural world. And it's created a lot of, you know, are you going to join the new trend? Or are you going to totally reject the new trend? Or are you going to try to join the new trend of globalization and growing your economy, but using a local flavor, something we call glocalization. Remember, glocalization has to do with, it, it's kind of a little bit what the Amish do. Okay, they're making plenty of money off using the global marketing aspects, but they're making stuff in their way that pretty much fits their culture, but it's also conveniently for them in high demand throughout the United States and even in other parts of the world. So make sure you understand what economic globalization looks like, what the opposite of it looks like. You know, globalization leads to more heterogeneous populations more diversity, but globalization also potentially leads to the loss of languages, the loss of religions, and more dominant languages, dominant religions, more international business languages, that type of thing, okay? And as, as countries or states try to rule their people and decide on options for their economy, then they're going to be looking at this idea of you know, if we let these foreign companies come in and mine our resources, that means in the next five years, you know, $300 billion. If we don't and protect our culture, where are we going to be able to find that money? So that's the give and take that comes in with this. And obviously then you can get into environmental concerns and stuff like that as well. Uh, Krista threw in the term placelessness there. And that would, again, be another nice concept to wrap into a review of globalization. As I'm thinking globalization, I am. I'm trying to review and have, you know, in my notes there in the same place, things too that, like, politically. What does political globalization looks like? Or look like, sorry. It looks like a lot of trade treaties, free trade. It looks like a lot of supranationalism. That's globalization. Devolution is kind of the opposite. Even though popularizing devolution in one place can possibly increase the chances of devolution in another place. World's complicated, okay? So everything may be very situationally based. In general, devolution is not something that is a absolute byproduct of globalization. But then again, people who oppose a lot of aspects of globalization may 
hunger for devolution. See what I'm saying? Okay. And if that sounds complicated, because it is. It is complicated because every situation may be different. So review here, scale change, different types of scale, reading your maps, reading graphs and charts, globalization, distance and distance decay versus time-space convergence, and throwing in the gravity model even. I would even throw that in connected to this unit somewhat in that how our world has changed. Globalization has impacted how two items or two groups of people and how far they are apart from each other, how much they relate. Remember, the gravity model measures connectivity, how much two places interact with each other. And the gravity model says it's not all about distance. Distance decay says it is. The gravity model comes along later and says distance matter matters, but population matters more. And so two places that have a big population are going to be more connected. You need to be able to explain how connections in our world have become so compressed. The time it takes to have those connections have become so compressed. Time, space, compression, convergence. Due to these technological innovations, but you also have concerns with that because now people who are trying to protect those minority cultures are more in contact with the global world around them. Right? So distance, space relationships, timing of space relationships. Think about two places that are more isolated, and especially if they are isolated physically and they're poor, because if they're poor, that probably means they're not as tech savvy and tech developed, which means they don't have the connections maybe to social media. Maybe they don't have the connections to, you know, the latest updates in the medical world. Although there are few and far of those places, can't figure out the right way to say that. There are few of those places left in the world today. Even in Sub-Saharan Africa, as we talked about in class, what triggered the dropping death rate? Think about it. It wasn't the Industrial Revolution, but it was exposure to knowledge, globalization, in the medical world. New ideas about what makes people sick, how to stay healthy, and how to combat different things. Okay, and the Basque region is a great example of an area where there's been physical isolation. And even the, the Kurds are not as great an example because they're not as physically isolated. They're politically and culturally isolated. But the Basque are a better example. But in recent years, the Basque now have more connections to the outside world. And so they're getting their story out there a little bit more. And they're also learning more about other devolutionary movements. They got their eyes on Catalonia especially since it's in Spain as well, as things happen, okay? Uh, one other thing I will bring in here that I think is another possibility from Unit 1 is regions and types of regions, formal, functional, vernacular, knowing those types of regions, knowing how they work. Also, diffusion, you could put that in this unit. You could put it in the cultural unit. Works in either place. That's obviously an important one, the different types of diffusion. But regions are important. I would understand, for example, if I say the word network, if I say the word network, what kind of region best comps to that, best relates to that? And the best answer would be a functional region because the functional region is all about network, a hub, a center, a node, and the area that operates around it. Whereas a formal region usually has some definite boundaries. It could be a political boundary. It could be a agricultural boundary, it could be a language barrier, but it's something that can be measured. Whereas perceptual is stuff that takes, really takes shape in our minds, everybody has a different opinion, and then that mindset that we have of where a boundary is located perceptually is based off of cultural, usually, reasons. And it's not a bad idea to go back and, and look at those regions again, especially too. Maybe look at things like cognitive maps, because cognitive maps help you understand things like perceptual regions. The way we see the world as people, individuals, is not often 100% accurate geographically. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording at this point, because I think I've made it through the...